Okay, okay. Okay, about 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Please tell us your name and where and when you were born. My name is Thomas Grossman, G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N, spelled in Hungarian G-R-O-S-Z-M-A-N. I was born in Budapest, 1927, May 1st. Okay, did you live in Budapest your whole life? No, actually I haven't. I was born in Budapest because, uh, uh, basically because uh, the facilities for birth and all, all that was much safer in, in the uh, capital city than anywhere else. Hey, tell us about your parents and your early family life. My father was a retired uh, officer from the uh, Royal Hungarian uh, Railroads and uh, Army which was actually uh, basically a joint venture back in those days. The uh, uh, railroads were controlled by the government and the army as such, indirectly. And um, uh, my mother was staying at home mostly, rearing my two sisters and myself. Hey, tell us about your family life. Uh, when you were growing up? What was the Jewish community like? Well, we lived in a small town uh, in the uh, Tokai area, which is famous of its wine production. My father, after retiring from the railroads after shortly after World War I, uh, went into uh, a business uh, of uh, wine uh, production and uh, in uh, wood uh, business of various different kind, uh, namely uh, firewood production and, and also railroad ties. Okay. Um, tell us about your your what type of school you went to and. Um, did you live in an all-Jewish environment, or was it a... a well, that was not really such a thing as that uh, uh, in uh, our uh, cities or, or uh, villages or towns. There was not uh, strictly a Jewish environment. It, it was pretty assim much assimilated at all times, except maybe the uh, uh, super-Orthodox, the... Uh, sort of lived for themselves, but even even uh, their children went to public schools and, and, uh, uh, and associated with uh, non-Jewish children. Uh, the um, balance of the community, of course, uh, the Jewish community was divided to more or less two parts. One, uh, one was an Orthodox community, and one was uh, super-Orthodox, uh, which was Beit HaMidrash uh, part uh, that uh, was very Hasidic and uh, quite religious uh, group. Um, we were all know known one another, and uh, living in a small town of a uh, population of 4,000, everybody knew everybody. About 4,000. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so your school was attended by j both Jewish children and Gentile children. Right. Mm -hmm. Was there any anti-Semitism growing up? There were always anti-Semitism in Hungary. Mm -hmm. That went with the territory, how so did, to speak. How did that um, uh, impinge on your daily life? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, which was the wrong thing to do by our parents to uh, 
tell us not to pay attention to it, which, uh, which is the worst thing to do. You do need to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. For instance, what type of, um, uh, were there rules or was it they, Jewish people just slighted by teachers or shopkeepers? What are, what are some? Well, te we, we were never slighted by teachers as such, you know, uh, not openly, not in front of a class or uh, anything like that. We were, if we were slighted, we were slighted by uh, our classmates or uh, our cl uh, some of our classmates' parents or something like that, but not, not by our teachers. That wasn't a policy. We did have um, school prayers, which was mandatory in all Hungarian schools, but uh, uh, it was a, uh, strangely enough, a totally non-denominational prayer. Never uh, said anything about neither this religion's God nor the others. Never anything was mentioned except uh, the Catholic kids was making the uh, sign of the cross and, and, uh, and the Protestant kids were standing there with their uh, hands uh, uh, held together and, and the Jewish kids were just standing straight but saying the prayers. So the discrimination was more on a private level rather than institutionalized? Type At that thing. time, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did things change, or did things change, in your town after the war broke out? Well, it, it, was, it was quite a bit of difference. In the first place, um, uh, bef even before the war broke out uh, officially, 1938, uh, under the regime of uh, Kalman Darani, uh, we had the first uh, so-called Jewish law, which was a... Uh, Pretty, uh, I would say, hefty, but yet uh, not comparing to other things, not too bad of discriminatory law. And yet it was the beginning, because at that time they already started out with uh, not granting uh, uh, business licenses, new business licenses to. Uh, uh, new Jewish enterprises, not uh, uh, letting Jewish students uh, go to universities, mm -hmm. except in, in uh, what you called numerous clauses, which uh, uh, entailed a, a certain percentage, and um, uh, which eventually uh, followed into uh, uh, high schools and, and, uh, and uh, colleges. Uh, in addition to professional universities like uh, engineering, uh, uh, in uh, colleges and in other other places. Mm -hmm. So at one time, even Jewish children were prevented from from entering high schools. That came later on. Mm -hmm. About when do you remember? That came actually in the uh, uh, mid, not not mid, but the early forties. Mm -hmm. By that time, we had uh, like uh, uh, the new uh, new entry level was. Uh, Six percent. So only six percent of the students could be Jewish. Right. Up until that was twenty percent, which was uh, absolutely no problem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, it was always less than twenty percent who wanted to enter uh, 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 high school. Mm -hmm. um, when did things begin to get worse? Things was really gotten worse in the. Uh, uh, like 41 and 42, that uh, we had uh, different uh, heads of states, uh, like pr uh, prime ministers who was imposing stiffer laws and imposing uh, uh, work camps to uh, Jews. The uh, Jewish uh, man was uh, expelled from the Hungarian army and uh, sent to uh, what you called uh, uh, labor camps instead of uh, <clears throat> uh, army, but still that was not a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. It was a different uh, level. It was, it was like an army, but uh, uh, strictly Jews, and, and it had to wear a yellow uh, uh, armband. Mm -hmm. 
what type of laws were passed that restricted your own daily life as your, as a child and with your family? Basically, what restricted me was really none. I, n I have not um, felt or wasn't affected of any of these laws because of my father's position as a uh, retired uh, person from railroad and army and in uh, uh, his deeds of uh, to the Hungarian government uh, various different things that he was exempted from all laws uh, that was uh, discriminatory against uh, Jews. Did you have to carry special papers showing that you were exempt from these laws? No. Or how did not really. How did they know to enforce it with the family here, but not with your family? Well, uh, basically, uh, when you live, you lived in a small town. Uh, uh, everybody knew you, so nobody mm -hmm. really bothered you as such, like from the police or, or from the uh, townhouse officials or uh, uh, city hall or something like that. Mm -hmm. When did things begin to change for your family also? Uh, it began to change, and it changed uh, like uh, overnight in uh, 1944, and that was after the uh, overrun of the Nazi army of Hungary, 19, March 16, 1944. And what were the changes that you remember? Well, changes were devastating. Tell I mean, immediately uh, schools were closed. Uh, all Jewish children was expelled from school. Uh, we, were, we had curfews to uh, abide by. We could not go out in the streets. We uh, were told to wear a yellow star. Uh, it, it was in chronological order, so to speak. Okay, if 1944, uh, uh, March 16th, I was living in a town called Kasha. Uh, it was formerly part of Czechoslovakia. Now, again, is Czechoslovakian territory, the town, uh, the city called Košice. Uh, I was a high school student there, uh, boarding in the small towns in Hungary where no uh, high schools. And high schools were somewhat higher level in, in, uh, in academic uh, 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 achievements and academic uh, uh, requirements than high schools mm. in this country. Uh, those uh, schools are called gymnasium, which is not the same as a <laughs> gymnasium here. Uh, to uh, illustrate you something, we uh, we had uh, uh, we started first class of uh, first year of gymnasium and uh, after first after four year of uh, public school and uh, immediately uh, had Latin. They have eight years of Latin. Uh, third years of, of school, we had uh, two more foreign languages and algebra, pretty heavy. In the fourth grade of, of the gymnasium, we already had uh, 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 second degree equation and calculus mm -hmm. and, and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm in the mathematics level, in, in physics, and in, in so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a pretty heavy uh, uh, curriculum mm -hmm. uh, as such, but uh, we were used to it. That's, that's the way the educational system worked. Okay, so um, on when March 16th arrived, you were away at boarding school. Right. I was in Kosice. I, I attended uh, my uh, sixth uh, grade of gymnasium and uh, we were uh, the day before we were celebrating this was March 15th we were celebrating the uh, March 15th revolution of uh, the uh, Hungarians against the uh, uh, Austrian uh, regime and that was which was 1944 and, and the uh, Revolution took place in 1848, 
and everybody was happy and uh, gay that we uh, achieved what we achieved. The hung Hungary was free, and ironically enough, next day we were uh, SS tanks and uh, Wehrmacht boots marching uh, on our streets again. Of course, uh, schools were immediately closed, and uh, we were advised to uh, those of us who were not um, uh, actually uh, living in that time to uh, pack up and go home to our, our respective parental homes, which I did. And uh, everything was relatively calm in for two or three days, and then the different little uh, uh, things came about, you know, like uh, we had advertisement or, uh, or uh, told us, uh, oh, you know, that that little town, for instance, we had no radio or radio communication. They had had a man who came out with a drum and beat the drum, and then uh, and uh, he was the town crier, mm -hmm. what they called, and. and and told everybody what the new laws are. And he was uh, uh, telling everybody that uh, uh, all men and women of the Jewish faith now will have to display a, a, a yellow, uh, not first not the yellow star, but they have to stay in, in their homes between 6 in the morning and 6 at night. We could not get out of our homes. Uh, of course, that was a method to their madness because uh, the stores didn't open until 8 o'clock and they closed at uh, 5.30 or 6. So after that, we could not go out and, and do any kind of shopping. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have anything stored in our homes, uh, food-wise, uh, uh, any kind of reserves, then uh, we were in pretty bad trouble. If most of us, when we lived in a small town like that, you know, you had your own little vegetable gardens and, and animals and so on and so forth. So uh, you were really not in any kind of immediate uh, danger of, of uh, starving. But there were some people, sick and old, that uh, was really started suffering hardship. And that was the bad part about it. Then. Uh, Six or seven days later, came about to announcing the uh, uh, every Jewish uh, member uh, of the town have to report to the uh, town hall and uh, turn in their uh, mechanized vehicles, whether it was a bicycle or a motorcycle or a car or anything of that sort, including their jewelry and uh, rings, uh, uh, watches, and whatever that entailed. The next thing was, two, three days later, is the uh, announcement of wearing the yellow star, at which point the curfew uh, uh, was lowered. We could go out uh, during, during the day by uh, 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 having the yellow star displayed. Uh, that lasted about a week. A week later, uh, we were told that uh, we can expect some other changes. These changes were not told what it was, but uh, the following night, uh, the Hungarian uh, military police uh, knocked on our doors about two or three o'clock in the morning and at gunpoint ordered us to uh, get two days of change, just put on what we have on, get two days of change of underwear and get out of your home. Uh, and uh, whereupon my father was, of course, you know, was got very indignant and told the men to get the hell out of there. That's his home, and the man told him, you, you damn Jew, you don't have any home. That's not yours anymore. Just get out. And we were herded into the uh, local synagogue, where we stayed for uh, uh, about a uh, little more than 48 hours. Everybody jammed up. The old, the sick, 
the uh, infant and uh, everybody else. No facilities could be used because there were no facilities inside in the synagogue in Hungary. First of all, that cannot, could not be done because of not an orthodox synagogue. Uh, so it had to be outside, but they didn't, did not let you go outside. So uh, you can imagine what took place. So the place was totally desecrated as a result. Like I said, 48 hours later, uh, or maybe a little more, I think we spent three nights and two days, we were herded down to the uh, uh, railroad station and uh, hurled into uh, boxcars and taken into provincial, ca provincial capital called Chateral uh, Yauihe. There was makeshift ghettos set up. Mm -hmm. What was the train like on your way there? Train wasn't. There was just boxcars, you know, mm -hmm. nothing too bad at that time because uh, the whole ride wasn't more than about two and a half hours, so it wasn't really bad and wasn't really that crowded, if I remember correctly. Maybe uh, hurled in about fifty, fifty-five or sixty people mm -hmm. in the boxcar. It shouldn't normally take more than uh, 40, 45. When I tell you the story later on, that uh, gets a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Good. Uh, we finally arrived to this place. Uh, their private homes were evacuated for the purpose of uh, setting up a provincial ghetto, which was for the, for the whole uh, province of Zamplain. And Zamplain was like a, a state of, we can compare like South Carolina, I mean, it was a little bit different uh, structure and infrastructure and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, set up, but basically uh, there was a governor and, and uh, and the lieutenant governor and so on and so forth and various different uh, political entities that went into that. And uh, we stayed there for six weeks and uh, in about 12 by 12 little room hurled in about 15 or 16 people person in which we had to sleep and, and stay in and so on. And towards the end of the sixth week, actually, uh, let me correct this, about three weeks later, you started hearing the uh, stories about we will be taken out of the ghettos and taken to uh, the southern part of Hungary where we going to be performing uh, agricultural work to help the war effort of the uh, glorious uh, German and Hungarian army to win the war against the uh, horrible United States and uh, England and so on and so forth. And, uh, the transports has started. Three transport came off and we were landing in the fourth. There were different kind of efforts made to uh, get my family out of the transports to uh, being sent away. Because whoever handled the uh, uh, case to uh, help us not to be sent knew exactly where we were going, even though they wouldn't tell us. After we were taken out to the railroad station and, and hurled into boxcars again, my one of my sisters were 
with us, my mother, father, and one of my sister, and my other sister were married uh, at the time in, uh, in the same time where I was going to school, as a matter of fact, of course she'd say. Uh, and we were just pushed into these boxcars, about 80 people at this time, not 50. And uh, all of a sudden, my oldest sister reappeared. I mean, just appeared from nowhere. Uh, and uh, in the company of an SS soldier and was put in the boxcar with us. And we, we were totally amazed because we couldn't understand where where she come from, and she explained to us that her husband were taken to a, one of these labor camps, and uh, the uh, soldier who was in Nessa's uniform, he was basically a friend of the family. He was a local boy, but uh, of uh, German uh, heri uh, heritage. And uh, he joined the SS when uh, the Nazis occupied Hungary. And uh, he was really helpful to uh, her family. I don't know how much harm he'd done elsewhere. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, she came and joined us. And the uh, thing that struck me, and I, I remarked to my father, that uh, there's one thing that uh, I don't understand, Dad. If, if uh, we go into southern Hungary to uh, perform agricultural work, how come these engines on the end of this train are pointing north? It so happens that uh, the provincial capital, Chateau Uyhe, was also a border town to Czechoslovakia. And Czechoslovakia was north, and still is north of Hungary. And there was no doubt in our minds that we are not going to uh, southern Hungary, but we are heading to Poland, which indeed it happened. Uh, in the meantime, while we were in the ghetto, of course, you know, it was different uh, things happened. It was very frightening. They pulled out people to go to work to do this and that, and these men never returned. And uh, we have heard... Uh, occasional shots and uh, different things. Uh, many other people, young people, men, women was badly beaten. And uh, it was a rather frightening experience. Uh, I could spend a lot of time to talk about it, but I don't think we have too much time to do that. The next stop, of mm -hmm. course, you know, after... But was your family personally mistreated in the ghetto? No, but no. You saw it around you. Mm -hmm. No, they uh, were actually never mistreated. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was one... We were, we were beaten a few times when we were actually hurled up to the train at the side of the provincial capital from the ghetto. Mm -hmm. But that was the only thing, you know, but it was not anything severe. But nevertheless, it was a beating. Mm -hmm. uh, after uh, about three days it took about 72 hours plus train ride to uh, our destination. 
We arrived to uh, Auschwitz. And uh, how that was figured out and calculated is still beyond me, but that was calculated so that we, we get there uh, right in the middle of the night, like 3 o'clock. It was pitch dark, and it was absolutely more frightening and more dramatic to to get out of a uh, box car than uh, than it would be uh, uh, eight o'clock in the morning or something like that. Uh, we had eighty people in the put into that car approximately, or maybe more. We uh, we had some people died during the old people died and and uh, during the uh, trip, which was very unfortunate. Here again, was were absolutely no facilities, and uh, you just had to take care of yourself best you could. Uh, <clears throat> the cars were sealed. There's no way to even look out when the cars rolled through stations. Nobody knew what it was because uh, uh, just uh, sped through stations. Occasionally, we were pulled aside to let other trains uh, pass us. You know, it's very strange. I, I, uh, the other night, I was listening to a program with uh, Ellie Wiesel. And he was uh, making a statement that they, uh, toward the final solution days, they were so obsessed that uh, uh, they let army trains pull aside to, to uh, make trains go to uh, deportation trains, go to faster to uh, the concentration camps. Or, or places like Auschwitz or other places. Well, I, uh, I did not experience that. I'm not saying that's not so. It could could have been so, but at the time we were taken, we were pulled off to let uh, other trains pass by. I know that for a fact. Uh, I, uh, it could be so, but I, I find it strange, hard to believe, basically, because I don't think. Uh, even uh, for the Nazis, it was that important to uh, let Jews suffer in the boxcar that they would let their precious army uh, trains to uh, sit aside. So that that is uh, some somewhat, uh, um, but it could you know anything can happen. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not saying that it didn't. Uh, when we arrived to Auschwitz, like I told you, that was a, that was a very frightening experience. There was this this SS running around with uh, uh, ferocious-looking German shepherds and uh, dogs, and uh, tried to uh, hurl off everybody from the box car. Then beating, they were beating us off of that car. They weren't just asking us to come down and, and hurry up, but they were actually coming up in that boxcar and beating everybody as uh, where they could f uh, uh, reach them. That was unbelievable. The cruelty of these people are beyond uh, human imagination. And anybody today who makes a statement that the Holocaust did not exist, and it's only an overactive imagination of Jewish people. Anybody who makes this statement ought to seek mental uh, uh, examination, because it did happen, I was there, and I do not have an overactive imagination. And that person can come to me 
and talk to me about it. And I tell him any time what happened, and I tell him any time where to go. On top of it, I promise you that person will never get lost in his life after that, because I'll direct him exactly where I want him to go. So much for that. Uh, the next thing is that um, when we were finally hurled off of that car, those box cars, we saw that humongous sign that said, it was, when we actually thought that we were in Auschwitz, we were not in Auschwitz. We were outside of Auschwitz. There was a gate, like the Arch of Triumph, and was written over it, Arbeit macht frei, which means labor makes you free. Yep, I don't want to comment on it. But at that gate, there stood a tall SS colonel. Or he may have been Captain Item. I'm not. Uh, exactly sure. I wasn't too familiar at that time with the uh, rank insignias. And he were standing up and pointing like this. And this man was Dr. Mengele. And he was pointing the old to, and the women, the pregnant women and uh, young children and mother with young children, and uh, older people who he felt that were unable to work to the left. And the able-bodied, quote unquote, to the right. And we were told, when we asked where are we going, those of us who spoke any German, which I did, we were told we were going to take some showers and we being will be deliced. Uh, I ask why should we delice? We have no lice. Well I I got a tremendous slap in the face when I made that statement. I was told to shut up and just go. We were standing in block of column of five and we, order to march. We were going into some big rooms, tremendous rooms with uh, pipes going all over the place with shower heads coming off the uh, pipes. And we were asked to uh, strip, leave our clothes there. There were some, and go, just step aside, and there were some uh, people who came with some uh, hand uh, uh, shear and sheared us or all our hair of our bodies, our hair, our head, and everything, and made us change into. Uh, we ha we could keep our underwear, but then in our shirt. And some of us could keep our shoes. Those were, were a little fortunate. Others had to take their shoes were even taken to give them, give them some wooden uh, uh, shoes of some kind. And then we had to change into these uh, uh, stripe uh, stripe suits, and give us gave us a cap of uh, the stripe cap of sort. So it was like a prisoner suit, uh, and uh, after we were given these stuff, we were told to put put these things down. That we were given, we were given a little uh, round uh, uh, piece of uh, it wasn't. It was a piece of hard paper, what but was framed with 
some light metal in with a number in it, which was our from there on our prisoner number that we had to memorize, we were told. And then we would go stepping into the shower. And since I'm here, you know that the shower was legitimate. Some of the others was not that fortunate. Some of the others who were hurled into the shower were told they're going to be um, cleaned and bathed. They had uh, cyclone gas coming out of the shower and die the most horrible death that you can think of and you can possibly imagine. And the, the horrible part of it is that the uh, cyclone gas specific weight is a good bit lighter than air. No, I'm sorry, heavier than air. And the fresh air was, was going up and the gas was going down. Uh, as a result, everybody was, <coughs> excuse me, everybody's climbing up on top of everybody else to gasp for the fresh air to, st to be able to stay alive until this hall actually was filled up with, totally with gas, and everybody was killed. Mm -hmm. Did your whole family get sent to the right, or did some of them get sent no, to the right? No, my whole family was sent to the right. To the right. And uh, so my father and myself ended up in one place, and my mother and my two sisters ended up in another place. Uh, we have seen them briefly after the showers to march off in one direction and we were marched to another direction. So we actually never went into Auschwitz, neither one of us. <clears throat> we stayed in Birkenau. Mm -hmm. Now Birkenau was, uh, was a horrible place. It was one of these uh, transient uh, camps and uh, people were just there to uh, waiting for transports over to uh, various different places. And so my father and I was shipped from there to uh, a place in Oberschlesien called Oberwustergisdorf. It was a small mining town that we were shipped to, and it, we were working in a stone quarry. Actually, inside of the mountain, we were building an airport, an airstrip, a landing strip, and also takeoff, absolute, mm -hmm. you know, obviously. And uh, we stayed there from uh, basically from uh, last of April of 1944 until uh, February 1945. During the time, of course, we were changed to two different camps, but somehow the other we were ended back up in the same place again. Uh, during the time while we were in that camp, uh, various things happened of different uh, atrocities of various different kind. Uh, but basically this was a work camp and uh, not much of the uh, infamous killings or anything like that took place. Uh, a couple of people tried to escape. They hung him uh, with an open display. Uh, I one time uh, stepped outside the gate purely as an accident. I was saw something and tried to pick picked it up and uh, 
I was shot at. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened. I wasn't hit, but nonetheless, I was shot at. As I got back, I was um, severely reprimanded and bodily uh, punished. 1945, February, we were uh, experiencing something very curious. Things, you know, we have seen uh, some very interesting things happening. We have heard thunder and lightning, which was rather peculiar in uh, uh, North Germany, Northeastern Germany, which was Northeastern Germany at the time. And uh, at that time of the year, that was beyond our imagination that we could hear thunder and lightning. And that was, of course, not any thunder and lightning. But uh, it was the uh, heavy artillery of the uh, Russian army that we have seen. During the time, because I, I, I like to mention this as well, while we were in these, in these labor camps, uh, we had several selections. People who got rather skinny and, and, and undernourished. They were selected out and sent back to uh, Auschwitz. And that was the first time, actually, we have really learned, when, when we have found out that they're being sent, sent back to Auschwitz, what was really taking place in Auschwitz. At the time when we were arrived, we had no idea what that fantastic uh, red sky meant, the flames mm -hmm. and the stench of burning flesh. We had no idea what that, what that come from and what, we never experienced anything like that. And we have found out as we were there that uh, some, some of the guards who were old and and uh, talkative, and, and just tell us, you, you won't behave, you're going to do, you're going to end up like your buddies there. So what are you talking about? Well, they were sent back to Auschwitz and it's going to be burned. What do you mean burned? But don't you know what's going on? I said, no, how would we know? Who would tell us? So he actually told us that these people will be sent back to Auschwitz be gassed and cremated. And so when we arrived and we saw all this, this uh, fantastic flames and, and, and the sky red and everything else, uh, that's what we saw. Were you still with your father at this point? Yes. So February 1945, like I told you, we've seen this um, artillery mirages, which we have thought at first was thunder and lightning. Uh, the Nazis decided that they're going to have to occupy, uh, they have to uh, evacuate the uh, camp, and everybody who were able to walk or march will have to go. And my father at this point, unfortunately, was not able to walk, so he was left behind in, in the uh, barrack for the uh, sick. And the rest of us were take, taken uh, on a trip, on foot. And that, this trip took uh, two weeks. We were marching. 
seven hundred of us. Two weeks later, or maybe a little more, maybe a little less, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure at this point, we arrived to a camp called Flossenburg. Two hundred of us. The rest of them was either just died on the roadside or shot to death by the SS. If they could not walk or they refused to walk because they were too tired, they just simply shot at the back of their neck. And that was the end of it. Flossenburg was an unbelievable concentration camp. It wasn't only a uh, Vernichtungslager, which means uh, a uh, total elimination camp, but were also uh, set up to torture, to starve, to beat, to uh, reduce people to an absolute subhuman level. The slightest punishment for anything you have done that was a crime in the Nazis' opinion was hanging. When we were marched into this camp, we have to file by 12 people hanging. We had to look at it for various different crimes. And then we have to be called for a sail appell, which was a normal occurrence in the concentration camps anyway, but uh, this was uh, uh, just unreal of any, any, any camp I ever been to because we were called to a roll call for uh, 5.30 in the morning and we stood outside, rain or shine or snow or, or sleet or whatever, until about 10 o'clock in the morning, and then they let you go back to your barrack and they called you out again for something else. This wasn't a work camp. They just, they just had you there to, to slowly kill you. One day I uh, volunteered for uh, work detail because I just couldn't stand uh, sitting in these barracks and every day waking up with somebody dying next to me. Every morning I woke up, I woke up to a corpse next to me, or pretty much so anyway. I uh, volunteered to work, so I, they let me work to unload trucks of various different kind. Here came a truck bringing food for the SS. They brought in big uh, baskets, you know, like uh, wash baskets, laundry baskets, full of bread. So I took one. I knew if I get caught, I'd probably get killed. Well, I didn't care. I was so hungry, I haven't seen a piece of bread for I don't know how long. So I just took one. 
and uh, sure enough, I got caught because uh, somebody saw me to take it, and uh, he wanted half of it, and I gave him half of it, and three others jumped, and uh, I ended up with nothing, but that was reported. So I was sentenced to be hanged. Well, I was fortunate because a delegation from the Swiss Red Cross came in and all the uh, over-exaggerated punishment had to stop. But they shipped me out of that camp the next day by train with a bunch of other guys. And we ended up in Dresden, Germany. It was a work camp. They gave us a little food. They took us out every day to work on the streets. The detail I wor worked with, we went to the uh, railroad station that was bumped to sh shreds by the American Air Force. You know, it was a beautiful sight. I enjoyed, I enjoyed cleaning up the rubble. I was just wishing that they had done a little more than that. Mm -hmm. So we were there for about, um, I think two or three weeks, something like this. During this time while I was in Dresden, when I had a very uh, curious experience. One day they, they wanted me to uh, come and peel potatoes which I did, and there was a young SS guard was sitting there. And he was sitting there across uh, the yard from me and, and peeling an apple. And he had a knife, and I, and I, when I'd seen him to peel an apple, I, I, I just, felt so craving for that apple, you know, I, I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. And I must have looked kind of hateful at him, you know. He must have felt something that, uh, uh, that it wasn't pleasant coming from me. So, so he came over and asked me what, what I'm looking at. I said, I'm looking at you. He said, don't look, I cut your eyes out. And he, he, he he actually took his knife that he had and, and, and aimed it to my eye, and I, I just bent my uh, head down real quick, and he cut a uh, piece of my eye uh, here, so I still have that scar. scar. And then, for some strange reason, two days later, I was shipped out of there, too. And we ended up, well, actually, at this point, we, were, we weren't we were shipped out. We were really marching, uh, partially. Uh, no, we, we, we'd been taking a train from Dresden and then, then taken off the train and started marching. During the march, we had two air raids. And then we had a very, uh, very bad episode one time. I had been together with, a, with a, a very dear friend of mine who was also my classmate. And I was kind of aiding him. And uh, one day while we were marching on on the road, a horse-drawn flat bed wagon comes up 
with two SS men and ask us who is tired that wants to ride the flatbed. And my friend said, I'm going. I said, no, you're not. Yes, I am. You don't be crazy. You come too. I said, no, I'm not going. I'm absolutely not going. And you don't go either. Oh, come on, don't be silly. So he went. And so did 25 others. All around, sitting around on those flatbed, and, and some in the middle of the flatbed. And then the two asses took off. And they took off the road. The horses started running, you know, galloping, or trotting, whatever. And then they weared off to the to the left. I remember like it was it was today, into the woods. And all of a sudden, I I hear the uh, submachine gun going off. And these two bastards are coming back and asking. Smiling, he says, anybody wants a buggy ride? So we kept on marching. About two days later, we arrived to a camp called Light Merits. It's in Czechoslovakia. Named today as Little Merice. This was pretty well in the uh, beginning of April at this point. And uh, 